Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is wonderful to see you this morning. Welcome to church. Uh, before we get things kicked off, I just want to do a quick announcement just to let you know that on Monday, so tomorrow, the modem for the internet is going to arrive at my house. And on Tuesday, the technician is going to arrive to actually install the internet. So prayerfully, if not by this weekend, the following weekend, we may have the capacity and the ability to do some online streaming. So a big thank you to Joyce who was able to follow up with Telstra and they were taking uh, a long time to get things sorted out, but she managed to get a lot of those things organized. So a massive thank you to Sister Joyce for doing that for me. And please pray, please pray that everything will run smoothly and that we'll be able to start fellowship. And again, those that are able uh, with the ability to gather again as brothers and sisters and enjoy worship together. So let's sing some songs and sing praises to our God now. See you guys soon. Hi church, welcome to another service. It's my pleasure to lead you in worship this morning. Um, to start, let us read from Micah 4 verse 2. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The Lord will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. How great it is it that we can come worship God together. So let us come, let's worship him. Let us declare the names of God, that he is our healer, he is our protector, he is for us, um, he is our father, he is um, Jehovah Jireh, El Shaddai, Mighty One. Let's worship him together this morning, church.
It's Pam here, and truly it's wonderful to be able to come and say hello to you, Grace Christian Church family. Indeed, it's such a blessing to be able to join in the time of bringing our praise and worship to God. I don't know about you, but there's something special about coming together in, in corporate worship. Even though we're online, you know, we're all singing our praises to God, and that truly is wonderful. So thank the team for continuing to facilitate worship um, and, and online church service for us each week um, and serving in that area. Hey, if it's your first time here um, you, or you've recently joined us over the last couple of months whilst we've gone online, a warm, a warm welcome to you. Uh, we're so glad that you have decided to join us. So glad to have you here and we hope that um, you'd be encouraged and, and blessed um, this morning during our, our service and our time together. Let me um, go through some announcements um, before we have a time of prayer and, and get into today's word. So, by way of announcements, whilst, um, whilst our church building remains closed um, for services during this time, we are continuing with our online services. Um, I encourage you, if you're able to and, and you feel comfortable, to perhaps invite you know, one or two people um, over to your house, it might be people from your small group or even friends in your neighborhood, um, to come in and watch the service online and, you know, have church at home. Um, I've definitely been doing that in the last couple of weeks um, up at Carissa's house and, and it's been great just to, just to connect again with, with people and, um, and worship together. You know, one of the things that I, I do miss um, from 
our physical um, meetings is it's the little break that we get in the middle uh, where we get to get up and, and go say hello to someone um, in the church, all right? And that's, that's usually a good time of, um, of activity there. Um, we can't do that, obviously, um, whilst we're all uh, remote. Um, however, you know, if you're missing your... Um, if you're missing those, those couple of people that you, you, you normally sit next to or, or sit in front of or behind that church and you're wondering, oh, what's going on with them? I'd encourage you, church, just to, you know, give them a call, send them a text, um, shoot them an email, jump, you know, get on, get on, get connected. Um, I haven't seen some of you guys in, in months. You haven't seen me in months as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to just get connected again with, um, with, with people. Um, another way that we can do that is also through uh, through the Zoom chat. So we do have a Zoom fellowship chat after the service uh, on Zoom and you'll find the details to connect there on the GCC announcements WhatsApp group. But it truly is a, a great time uh, where we can uh, come together, say hello to one another, see what each other's getting up to um, and you know perhaps even pray for one another um, as well. So I hope to be able to see you um, online after this. Another way to um, keep connected, and for me, I know it's been definitely uh, an, an important um, part of my routine um, since uh, since COVID started, um, is to get connected through your small groups, your, your grace groups. Um, we meet, our group meets weekly, and um, there's different groups and, and um, various frequencies that they meet in various days. Um, but truly, um, you know, it's it's a true demonstration of uh, the church community beyond just the, the physical, you know, the four physical walls of the church on a Sunday afternoon. Um, it's where we do life with one another uh, throughout the week. Um, we pray for one another, we encourage one another, and just sharing your life. Um, and, and that's truly what I believe the, the church is about. Um, so I encourage you to continue meeting up in your small groups, uh, whether it be online or if some of you are, are comfortable in having small small uh, group gatherings in, in somebody's house, definitely uh, stay connected there. Um, if you're not part of a small group, um, I can't encourage you even more, you know, any more to, to, to get involved in one. Um, you can email the um, the leaders. So the email the leaders the email leaders at gracechristian.com.au and say, hey, I want to join a small group. Um, can you let me know when one's on and, and plug me into one? Uh, I'm sure they'll be able to help. Uh, church, let us now continue to um, worship God through um, through prayer and uh, and also um, as we go into a time of, uh, of offering as well. So will you join me um, in prayer today, church? Uh, Father God, we, we come before you today in, uh, in humble adoration. Um, we praise you for who you are. Uh, we continue to worship you as, uh, as a church family. Even though we're online at the moment, um, we thank you God even for the simple fact that we're able to connect online and um, still continue to have church services um, and even simply praying uh, with one another right now. Truly indeed, you are um, a great God, uh, even in the midst of um, this global pandemic at the moment. Um, we continue to see your faithfulness and mercies uh, afresh and anew every day and know that you are still and always um, God that is in control of these situations. You truly are um, a God that goes before us and makes a way um, before us um, even when we can't see um, too far ahead um, so we continue to pray for our communities and the world at large as well especially during this time um, where um, nations are still um, grappling with and battling with this um, this disease that's that's continues to spread and we can't really get a handle on um, we there's also communities and and countries where they're experiencing a lot of um, unrest um, in, in areas that you know we we don't even hear about um, but we know God that um, yeah there are people with needs there and you know there's, there's natural disasters going on um, but Lord all that does it, it just highlights how much we are dependent on you um, you know despite what we can control um, Lord ultimately you are the ultimate 
um, you know, one who controls everything and, and brings things to order. So Father God, we commit these things um, to you. We commit communities who are broken. We commit um, areas that are, you know, in, in conflict and um, under so much stress and um, disaster areas. Um, Lord God, um, we pray for comfort where comfort is required, um, for homes, for, for individuals. Um, we pray for wisdom, continued wisdom for our leaders, um, you know, whether that be at a global level, at a, at a nation level, at a, um, you know, even in our states, in our, um, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, Father God. Um, you've placed leaders there and we pray, Father God, that you give them um, wisdom to, um, to know how to guide, you know, um, through, through your wisdom, um, things that they need to um, take people through. Um, we pray for your strength as well, for, um, for people who, you know, really do need your, your um, encouragement um, to get through uh, the situations that they're having um, at the moment, to be able to see uh, clearly what the next step is and, um, and to really trust you with um, you know, what, you're, what you're taking them through. We, um, we pray for those who are currently sick uh, or unwell, um, and we know that, God, you are the ultimate healer. Um, we have seen you heal so many times, um, even miraculously as well, even in our church, um, in our church members as well. Um, and so, God, we continue to bring those who are unwell or, or sick or, or injured, um, whether it be physical, um, mental or, or emotional uh, healing that's required. Um, Lord God, we commit these people to you, um, that you bring healing there. And through all this, Lord God, we, um, we know that your name will be glorified and, and magnified. So help us, Father God, as your church, um, you know, uh, to be an extension of your love um, and grace in, in our world, uh, that we can bring true hope and uh, point people towards um, an eternal um, and saving relationship uh, with yourself. Father God, we... Um, praise you and thank you for um, continuing to be our provider and for all uh, that you um, have provided for us and um, more, that, more than we need as well. Um, today, Father God, as we prepare for our, um, the offering, um, Lord, um, let us um, give with cheerful hearts. Uh, let us give back um, what is, you know, I guess rightfully yours, a portion of what is right, rightfully yours. Um, and what you've given to us um, and may we be faithful with, um, with our giving. Uh, we pray for um, our leaders as well as they um, steward the, the resources, um, whether that be financial or um, you know, in terms of our time and, and talents and, and what we do. Um, Lord, may us as a church um, yeah, steward those gifts and resources um, faithfully um, for the extension of your, uh, your kingdom. Uh, and God, um, as we also look to um, hearing from you through your word today, give us teachable hearts, Father God. Um, may we truly be transformed um, by your word today as we learn more about who you are and, um, and what you desire for us. So we commit the rest of this service into your hands today and um, we pray all these things in, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Um, a reminder, if you are um, uh, wanting to um, give your offerings um, via online um, bank transfer, you'll find the um, bank details on, uh, on the screen right now. If you, you know, it's wonderful to be able to pray together, um, but if you do need um, prayer, like personally, um, or if you have any specific prayer points um, or prayer requests that you want um, the leaders or the pastors to, to pray um, for you or with you, um, then um, please uh, connect um, again through the website. Um, there should be a link um, for you to be able to submit a, a prayer request there. Uh, we'd love to pray for you as a church um, for any specific needs that you have as well. And um, you know whether 
that be, um, like I said, get connected through um, whether you're through your work, sorry, your um, connect group, um, or um, you know even after the service, um, let us know so that we can pray for you. Right. So um, now, if you have one of these, um, it's a Bible. Um, my paper copy um i don't know i'm a bit old-fashioned i still like flipping through the pages or you might have it on your phone or your uh, laptop um god's word truly is important and um i can't wait to get into the word um through pastor joe today who's going to bring in, um, us a word from god today and um see what revelations we get so why don't you join with me grab your bibles um, and follow along as joe brings us today's message Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another Sunday where we get to not only worship, but to spend time in the Word together. Wow, things have been a bit crazy, haven't they? They seem to be taking a step backwards as the virus is making a pretty major comeback and is threatening to shut down Sydney again. So please pray. Pray for those within our church family who are at risk. Pray for those within our community as well and how we can best shine the light of Jesus Christ to them. Pray for our premier of New South Wales, uh, Gladys. Gladys, Ber I don't know how to say her name. Oh, Berejiklian. I apologise if I've mispronounced that, Miss Premier. Uh, pray for the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, as well, that they'll have wisdom in how best to handle this situation because there is a lot of intense feelings that are going on. There are fears that the city and that the state might be shut down completely again. And then there are fears on the other extreme where people are fearful that we won't shut down and might spread the virus even more. There are people who are feeling the financial struggle, the economic strain within people's families and within their means to be able to provide for those families. You have people that are walking that fine edge in the medical field that are looking for something to help sort of quell the fears of the virus, as well as caring for those people who are infected by it. And on top of all of that, you have people that are just paralyzed because of uncertainty and hopelessness within life. So pray, pray, pray. I'll encourage you to do so. But even while we pray, praise God as well. Praise God that even though while well, we do experience those same limitations and those same restrictions, we know that the Lord is in control. We know that he is working to his plan and that he is bringing about his purposes within the bigger scheme of what he is doing. It is never beyond or out of his hand what is taking place. And while people may blame God, or you might even blame God and say, well, I thought God was about my happiness and about my contentment and about having a problem-free life, which is a complete misconception and completely unbiblical. Because as one of my favorite writers, William Lane Craig, makes this statement, he says, for many, they believe if God exists, he exists for their personal happiness. When the reality is God's existence is for us to know him and to glorify him forever, which leads to happiness. Our happiness, our fulfillment comes in knowing who God is and having a legitimate, real relationship with him. So this morning and over the next few weeks, we are going to have some biblical lessons or what I like to call one shots as we look to rediscover the certainty of our God at work in these current times. So with that, let's open a word of prayer and dive into the word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you so much that you are in control and Father, I pray that you'll open our eyes to see your hand at work even now. 
As we look at your word, may we recognize you ministering to our hearts. And I pray, Father, that there will be more than just words, but rather truths that will not only impress upon our hearts, but transform them as well. We commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 5 and our brother Brad, I'm sorry, Brad is going to read for us this morning. Brad, over to you. Today's Bible reading is from the book of John chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Thank you very much for that, Brad. Now, if you'll notice in the reading of that passage in John chapter 5, verses 1 through to 15, you'll notice the circumstance in which Jesus positions himself. So he moves into the situation where there is a lot of need. And prayerfully, as we look at this passage today, we will be encouraged by the action the Lord Jesus takes in meeting that need. So we read of all the people that are looking to be made whole. People in search of hope, people in search of help, people in search of healing. And we're described specifically about these people in verses 3 and 4. So if you look at verse 2, we'll start at verse 2 and read down to verse 5. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which is in Aramaic, is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades or colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, and they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured for what, of whatever disease they had. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. You'll notice in the NIV that that verse 4 is actually at the bottom of the column there with a little note. But I wanted to include that in this reading. Because in this reading, there's a lot of sick people. There's a context of people that are in need. And it is here we find Jesus who places himself in the middle of that need. And he does what he often does throughout all of his ministry and through all of his earthly existence is that of taking the initiative. I look at this and we see Jesus's initiative. In verse 6 we read, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Now, Many years ago, I had the privilege to sit under the teaching of a very godly man named Don Hay. He and his wife, Dee, Don and Dee Hay, were such great blessings to our little church in West Auckland because they, as a loving couple, taught us about the practicality 
of the grace of God at work in people's lives, the transformative power of divine grace. And one time at a church camp while he was sharing about grace and the love from which grace springs, that divine love, that agape love, that selfless love, that benevolent love, he shared about true love always takes the initiative. True love always initiates. It takes the first step in order to express itself. It is how God expressed his love to us in Jesus. He saw our need. Therefore, he cast his glory aside to adorn himself in flesh. He is the one who pursued us and chased us. He is the one who took the initiative, even though, as the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each has gone to his own way. But he took the first step by sending his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. You see, his initiative stirs within us and prompts a response in reply. In 1 John chapter 4.19, we read, We love him because he first loved us. And when you look at verse 6, you see such initiative take place because Jesus saw him. Jesus learned of his need. Jesus then approached him and then Jesus asks him. Here, the initiative of Jesus is demonstrated because the man could do nothing for himself. He was an invalid. He was a lame man who couldn't, well, he could move, but not very far or very well on his own ability. To quote one preacher, he said, the very thing that prevented this man from being well was the same thing that prevented him from approaching Jesus. The very thing that prevented him from being well was the very thing that prevented him from approaching Jesus. And that picture, that description right there is reflective of the attitudes of humanity outside of God. The attitudes of humanity outside of the divine revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, people have an idea that they want change. They want to move on. They want to grow. They want to move into a life of contentment and satisfaction. And yet, like the invalid here, people, they as a people are limited in their ability to get anywhere. And what prevents them from getting well spiritually is the same thing that stops them from looking to the person of Jesus Christ and seeing him as the healer, seeing him as the one who can make people whole. And the Bible clearly labels that sin. Sin prevents people from seeing him who can give life. The Bible speaks to how the natural man has been blinded and unable to see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's what happens. That's the attitudes of people outside of Christ, outside of the commonwealth of God's kingdom. But then even as Christians, as his children, we can experience similar constraints, similar limitations, and we find ourselves trapped and unable to move. We're, we're dry in our spiritual walk. We're dissatisfied with our lives. We're wondering why we're not experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised. And, and, and we, we lose the joy of God's presence or even the empowering of his spirits, and, and we, like the invalid, are looking for something to deliver us, looking for someone to help us or to awaken us from our spiritual slumber. And, 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 we, and we find that that abundant life might just be 
out of out of reach. And it's because and we get into such a state because we have chosen, we have chosen to either one ignore the Spirit of God within our lives, who is our helper, who is our comforter, who is our teacher, who is our the unction, who is our anointing. We've we've decided to push him to the side through our own selfishness or through our own desire for what we want over what God wants. And so we find ourselves trapped. And the blessing of us being in such a state, if we can call it a blessing, but the reality is the blessing of being in such a state is that Jesus has taken the initiative toward us. He is the one that's taken the step toward us. He approaches us in our state of spiritual apathy as his child and in spiritual defiance as a lost sinner. And as the good shepherd, he goes forth to seek and save the lost. He asks of us the same question he asks of this invalid. He asks, do you want to get well? Do you? Do you want to get well? Do you want to be free? Do you want to be liberated, contented, and satisfied? I guarantee that each of you, along with myself, would answer yes. But how? And that's the problem, isn't it? How? How? That, and, and, and the way Jesus answers this question, or oh, sorry, no, forgive me, the way the invalid replies to Jesus' question portrays our problem. Portrays our problem. And that's found in verse 7. Now look, I, I stopped watching those reality singing shows a number of years ago. The likes of, say, Australian Idol or Australia's Got Talent, uh, um, The Voice, all those sorts of things. I stopped watching those a number of years ago. Part of the reason was because it became less and less about the musical talent of an individual and it focused solely upon their stories. It focused solely upon, oh, woe is me, woe is me. And each contestant almost had to come up with a story that outdid the previous contestant's sob story. It almost seemed a competition of one-upmanship. That's what it seemed to be. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not insensitive to their needs. I'm not some uncompassionate, talentless hack that doesn't care about what they've gone through or where they've come from. I mean, you know, it's awesome that they've overcome situations. I'm not looking at it that way. All I'm saying is because it became an appeal to an, epo an emotional reaction, almost like they're garnering support because they needed the votes of the public. And so I just, I just turned it off. Now, everyone has a story, and it doesn't matter how bad off you are, there's always somebody worse. It doesn't matter how well off you are, there's always somebody better in a better off situation. And so, you know, I, I don't... You know, so I just sort of stopped watching those things. So the, the answer that this man gives to Jesus when he says, do you want to get well, he doesn't actually say yes. He, he presents an argument. He presents a solid case as to why he should have compassion manifest toward him. Now, look, I have, I have no issue with that. But this is an akin to an appeal for compassion from the asker. He says, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So this guy's response isn't just a plain yes, but it is an appeal. Like I said, perhaps in an effort to garner some more sympathy from the person talking to him by elaborating on what he is going through. I want to get well, but I have no help. I want to get well, but I can't make it there myself. I want to get well, but others take it away at the last minute. And those reasonings are very applicable to both the Christian and the non-Christian alike. For the non-Christian, it's an accurate picture of one's natural state before God. 
that whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you believe it or not, you are a person that is captive to your own limitations before God. There is nothing in you to make yourself acceptable to him. There is nothing in you to cleanse you of your sin and to give you a new nature. You can't do that of yourself. It is why in John chapter 3, when Jesus speaks with Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. You must be born again. To which the, the logical answer that Nicodemus gives is, what, you mean I've got to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus is talking about a renewal of our natures. That in our current state, in our original nature, we are at enmity with God. That our sinful nature is in direct contradiction of who he is. That is our natural state. And you know this. You see this. You recognize this, that not all is well in the world. You recognize the fact that not all is well, even in your own world. Why, why there is still so much hatred, why there is still so much anger, why there is still so much selfishness. And you see this evident in the past several months with the amount of people who were just selfish when it came to the COVID-19 crisis. With the small glimpses of generosity, it did nothing to quell the utter selfishness of people by casting others to the side, other, whether it be the elderly, whether it be the sick, whether it be the disabled. You just cast them to the side. Why? Because you wanted what you wanted. Because we're fine being generous if it doesn't cost us. We're fine being generous as long as it doesn't threaten us personally. For once it affects us personally, then all generosity is out the window and then it's gloves off. Time for gloves off. It's time to get down and dirty. I want to get paid. I want to get what I'm going to get in order to make my life okay. And God calls that in the Bible, God calls that sin. God calls that sin. The sinful nature. And whenever, whether you like it or not, humanity is enslaved to it. In John chapter 8, verse 34, we read this. I'll, I'll read verse 33. He's talking to the religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees or the religious leaders, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied in verse 34, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. It is the best explanation of how we can go from the extreme, from one spectrum of being generous and giving abundance of money and goods to people, right to the other extreme of complete selfishness in the blink of a global pandemic. That is reflective of us, not even globally, but personally. We know that there's something wrong with us and that we cannot change ourselves. Now, when I say change ourselves, what I mean is change ourselves to an extent of where we will be accepted by God because he is holy and we are not. He is perfect and we are not. And because we are not, we cannot be as sinful beings in his holy presence. We try going to others to help. Only after reaching out, we find out that they have just as much, if not more, problems than we do. If, excuse my language. You find out that people are just as screwed up as we are. We try then to look to ourselves and look, okay, then I'm going to attain self-improvement myself, only to find out how limited I am, limited by my frustrations, limited by my lack of resources, limited by my way of thinking, limited by emotions, limited by abilities. We are limited in what we can do. And once again, for all our proficiency and efficiency to do things, we can do nothing to change our nature before God. 
It is completely beyond us. And so then what do we do? We look for a goal. We look for a cause greater than ourselves. And even while we try to live for a cause or to live for something other than us, we find that if it is not of, of any eternal significance, that our dreams will then just fade away and we walk away disappointed. Why? Because the Bible teaches that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And as those who are dead in our trespasses and sins, we are like the invalid who could not approach Jesus. We have to. We have to cry out and ask for help. So too are those whose sins have not been forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ. We are separated from him as well, unable to approach him. I mean, we can't do anything to save ourselves. We need to ask someone else to save us. Therefore, it requires Jesus to approach us and to bring us to himself. That's, that's just the reality of it. That's why it is him that takes the initiative. We are told within the scriptures that no man can come to the Lord Jesus Christ unless the Father first draws him. And he might be drawing you even now. Even for the Christian, in the same way, we find ourselves limited or restricted by what is taking place around us, and we can become ineffective in our Christian life. We feel dry, we feel bored with the routine of following the Lord. We find ourselves constantly struggling, constantly looking for the next encouragement to pick us up and to lead us to the, the stirring waters in order to experience a, a huge refreshing within our Christian life. We look at others and wonder, why is it that they're so passionate and enthusiastic? Why don't I experience such things? And we find ourselves walking around and around and around in circles, and we become weary in our Christian life, mainly because that, that yeah, we become weary in our Christian life, mainly because we're looking at everything else for that refreshing instead of to Jesus. Because in that weariness, more often than not, we end up just giving up and accepting such weariness as the normal Christian life. You see, it is in this state as a weary child and as a lost sinner, that Jesus takes the initiative, approaches us, and says, do you want to get well? And the key to that wellness, the key to our refreshing, the key to our revival, and the experiencing of the abundance of life that Jesus promised us, is displayed in Jesus' instruction. In verse 8 we read, Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. As basic as this is, as simple as it may seem, the key to living in victory as a Christian, the key to accessing eternal life as a non-Christian, is the simple act of responding to the instruction of Jesus Christ by faith and obedience. For the invalid here, it was merely him responding to Jesus and obeying the instruction given, so he did. So he did, even though he didn't know who Jesus was until later, the example given here isn't focused on how great his faith was, but rather who and what his faith was in. It was in the spoken word of the Lord that led him to a greater revelation in seeing clearly the person of Jesus when he encounters him again. You read verse 15, you see this. Now, we have given for us clear instructions laid out for us as God's creation and how we can move from a place of brokenness to a place of healing, from a place of captivity to a place of freedom, from enslavement to a place of liberation, to have sin forgiven, to have lives made new. And it begins, and it begins by following Jesus' instructions. Instructions of the like, say, of Matthew 4.17, when Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. It's not talking, 
repent is about a change of mind. The, the, the word used, it, it talks about a change of mind, how you used to think one way, now you think the other way. It's a 180 degree turnaround. Now, a lot of us think that repentance means, well, you have to stop this, you have to stop that, you have to stop. Well, that takes place after there has been a change of mind and a change of heart. That as there has been inward transformation, that results in external transformation. We sing from the inside out. We sing that. And that is the principle that is applied here. To repent means to understand, okay, this is what I used to think about Jesus. This is what is now thought about Jesus. I used to think that he was a fraud. Now I see him as the son of God. I used to think that he was fake. I now see him as the Christ, the son of the living God. I used to think this about him. Now I think that about him. And once I think that about him, therefore I will, as it says in Matthew 4.19, follow him. The words, more words of instruction. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And that word, come, follow me, is about commitment. If you believe he is who he said he is, then that would result then in the action that follows. Case in point, 2008 deeper camp, the camp where Julie was lying on the water, trying to start, not lying on the sand, trying to stop waves from destroying the sandcastle. I still remember that. One of the funniest things I've seen. Sorry, Jules. But I remember at the end of that camp, I had to get back to Sydney from Wollongong, myself, Nathaniel, and Jamal. Now, I had only been down there. This is long before GPS and stuff, so I didn't have. I had to use a map book to find the place, and I asked Pastor Ben if I could follow him back to Sydney. Now, here's what's interesting. Pastor Ben said, yeah, not a problem. Therefore, when I asked him, and he invited me to follow him, I had to, one, believe that he was capable of getting me from destination A to destination B. But me believing that doesn't do anything unless I follow through on that. So I believed he could get me to where I needed to go. That's faith. And then as I followed him and he got me to the destination I needed to be, that was obedience. That's why they work hand in hand. A.W. Tozer referred to them as being two sides of the same coin, that of faith and obedience. And Pastor Ben got me back to Sydney, to a place that I recognized and I was able to get home. And Pastor Ben's a wonderful driver. He didn't go one kilometer over the speed limit. 110, 110 on the dot. 100, 100 on the dot. 60, 60 on the dot. Thank you very much for that, Pastor Ben. But it's about repentance so a change of mind and a change of heart, and that inward change then results in outward transformation. Then there's the commitment of a following. But the most important instruction through the invita is, is, is to the invitation that Jesus gives us. And it is that invitation to a committed relationship with him, not to a set of rules, not to a church denomination, not to an ideology, but to himself. He says, in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Verse 26, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? To which I pose this question to you. If you are not a Christian, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? Do you believe that he was born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that he lived sinlessly and in accordance to God's will? Do you believe that he was crucified on the cross, a sacrifice and an atonement for your sins and my sins and our offenses against God? Do you believe that he was buried and three days later he was resurrected from the dead? Evidence that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, that he is the anointed deliverer, the son of the living God. Do you believe that if you trust in him for the salvation and forgiveness of sin, from sin and forgiveness of sin that condemns you to hell, that you can be born again by his spirit and become his child? Do you believe this? 
Because if you believe this, then what's stopping you right now from becoming his child? What's stopping you right now from committing your life to Jesus Christ? All it takes is a prayer. All it takes is to bow your heads, open your heart, and ask God to save you from your sin. And if that's something that you want to do right now, then just pray with me. Just pray with in the quietness of your heart. Just pray with me. And, and we'll do that right now. 30 seconds. Just pray with me right now. Bow your heads. If you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, where you might be born again into the family of God, then, then just pray with me right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I have sinned against you. I have offended your holy name. And I am deserving of your judgment. Thank you that you sent Jesus, who was born of a virgin, lived sinlessly, who was crucified and died to be a sacrifice for my sins. Thank you that Jesus rose from the dead and that through believing in him, I can be born again into your family. Please save me from my sin. Please rule in my heart. Please take control of my life. I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe that, do you believe this? Then, look, if you prayed that, if you prayed that, down here will be my phone number. There will be my phone number in Australia. And if you prayed that prayer, I want you to send me a text message. And I want you to send me a text message to let me know that you've prayed and that you've committed your life to Jesus Christ. And that... If, if you're not in this city, if you're not in the state, if you're, not, if you're not in the suburb, then I would love to try and help and, and to bless you by planting you and placing you within a church family that can help nurture you in this newfound faith. Because we are told, we are told in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. There is a confession, a proclamation of yes, yes, I've committed my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. So please send me a text message and I would like to welcome you to the family of God. You are now my brother, you are now my sister and I know it's, I'm yours as well. But anyway, so, okay? so please, please send me a message. I would love to hear from you and to be able to pray for you at this time. Now, and the reality is even as his child, even as his child, we can, I mean, it's not, it's not easy. It is not easy, but... It is the most fulfilling life that one can have. Because as his child, as his child, I'll be the first to admit that at times I have felt dry, that at times I have had struggles, and that at times I have even fallen and given into temptation. But the grace of God is such that when I'm in those positions of wandering or of struggle, he, like the invalid here, he comes to me and he says, do you want to get well? He, he comes to me and he ministers to my heart and he, he gives me words of encouragement and also words of instruction that I may overcome the restrictions that I have put myself in spiritually. Words of encouragement like, say in John chapter 1, verse 12, to as many as received him, which is what you have done right now if you have prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. To as many as received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Wonderful words of encouragement like Romans eight seventeen. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if we indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Or in other words, instead of looking at your restrictions, instead of looking at what you're not able to attain, instead of focusing on your lack or on your limitations, instead of looking at your situation, our eyes are to be looking at Jesus for our salvation, for our purpose, for our revival, and for our ability to live in Him. 
And when we have words of encouragement such as that, we also have some wonderful words of encouragement like Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Instruction like John 13.24, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And in John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For you and I to believe and receive such truths results in us, like the invalid, having the capacity to, in verse 9, pick up his mat and walk. To get up, pick up his mat, and walk. So like the invalid, the invalid who is set free from his restrictions, our freedom, whether it be from sin's hold, whether it be from apathy, comes from responding to the word of God by faith and obedience. Obedience to biblical commands, acceptance of divine truth, submission to God's authoritative will. Because the more I look at this, the more I come to realize how simple it is for you and I to get up, as the Lord Jesus invites us, or it could be used as a word I used before, repent, to pick up your mat. And the mat for the invalid was his life. It was his security. It was his place of comfort. To pick up his mat, that we might pick up our mats, or in, in other words, everything that we are, our lives, and that we might walk, following Jesus, walking in the light as he is in the light, walking in the newness of life because that is what he's granted us, walking in Christ. Yeah. So, my prayer is that today we might be encouraged to respond to the instruction that the Lord Jesus has given us to get up. That we will lay aside our problem and our self-centeredness and our selfishness because Jesus has taken the initiative to reach out to us in order for us to not only live in victory, but to live in abundance. So, brothers and sisters, yeah, let's get up, let's pick up our mats, and let's walk after the Lord. And let's see what he does in, through, and with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the example given here and the involvement you have within each of our lives. Thank you that you take the initiative, that you are the one who reached out to us, that you are the one that stretches out your hand to bring us out of our life of apathy, out of our life of spiritual, just a spiritual blah. And Father, that you invite us to get up, take up our mats and walk. Father, that you see beyond our problems because you are so much bigger than our problems. You are so much greater than our problems. And Father, that by following your instruction that you have given us in your word, we can experience the fullness and the abundance of the life you have promised us. So Father, we ask for you to dismiss us now, and I pray that you will enable us and help us and give us the courage to get up, take up our beds, and follow after you. So we ask for you to dismiss us now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you very much for that, brothers and sisters. I pray you've been encouraged in some way. If you're not able to make the Zoom meeting where we can spend some time to pray or to be prayed for, then I trust you'll have a great and safe week. Please look after yourself. And in all honesty, in this coming week, I'll see you next Sunday. In this coming week, walk strong. <laughs>